Thank you very much, Paul. So as Paul said, I'm going to go through where we stood at the time of the March budget, what that implied for tax spend, for borrowing and debt over the next few years. Then I'm going to think about how developments, both in terms of policy and in the economy, have changed that outlook for this time around. So firstly, the March budget plan. An important backdrop for every fiscal event in the UK since 2008 has been the terrible economic performance due to terrible productivity performance over that time. So here you see GDP per person since 2008. And according to the March plan, we're only just above the level that we were at the start of 2008. How bad is that? Well, let's compare that to what we might reasonably have expected, say a 2% per year trend. And we're actually 15% poorer than we might have hoped at the start of 2008. And according to the budget plan, we weren't going to be catching that up over the next few years. And actually, the gap was going to get bigger and be about 18% by the end of the forecast period in 2022. Now, when the economy performs poorly, that means uh, that tax receipts are lower, that's bad for the public finances, and a very large deficit opened up uh, during the Great Recession. You see that large fall in national income between 2008 and 2010. So what I'm now going to talk through is how the deficit has evolved since then. Firstly, there was the increase in borrowing between 2007 and 2009, and then the, this fairly steady reduction since then. We can decompose this change between 2007 and 2009 into increases in spending as a share of national income and reductions in tax revenues as a share of national income. And actually, almost all of this increase was driven by spending. That was because the government set some plans in cash terms, expecting reasonable growth in the economy. When the economy turned out to be much smaller than hopes, that meant that that same level of cash spending was a much higher share of a smaller economy. And on the other hand, even though tax receipts in cash terms were much lower than we'd hoped, as a share of national income, they're only about 1% down. So at the height of borrowing, we had a deficit of almost 10% of national income, a historic high. And since then, we've managed to get the deficit down. And again, we can decompose this into reductions in spending as a share of national income and a tax rise. And in the same way that most of the increase in borrowing happened due to increases in spending as a share of national income, so most of the reduction has come through reductions in spending. And at the same time, there has been a small net tax rise. So we've now got a deficit back to about the level we had before the financial crisis. Spending is still about half a percent of national income higher than it was then, but tax revenues are also higher by a similar amount. However, according to the March plan, there was still more to be done. There was still more deficit reduction to come. And that was to come, again, predominantly through further reductions in spending as a share of national income and another small net tax rise, so that in 2021-22, we were set to have a deficit of about 0.7% of national income, a relatively low level by recent UK historical standards. Now, importantly, this reduction from 2017-18 to 2021-22 was not due to a rise because of greater than expected economic growth, but rather it was a rise due to active policy measures taken um, by the government. So there was a small net tax rise in the pipeline worth about £6 billion. The largest new tax measure of that is the reduction in the dividend allowance from £5,000 to £2,000. That was a March budget measure. A slightly bigger contribution than that is coming from cuts to benefits. Now, a lot of this is from measures that are already on the statute book, but that will apply to more claimants over the next few years. Although the largest cut to come is two further years of the four-year benefits freeze, that's now a bigger saving to the exchequer and a bigger cut to real household incomes because inflation has turned out higher than expected. But as was the case from 2009 to now, so it is the case going forward. It's cuts to the spending of government departments that's doing most of the deficit reduction legwork. Leg and that, that cut as a share of national income worth £24 billion by 2021 is really the main driver of deficit reduction over the next few years. And it's not an even split between different elements of spending. Investment spending is actually due to increase as a share of national income to over 2% of national income. That would be a relatively high level by recent UK historical standards. But that means larger cuts to day-to-day -day spending. And the cuts are also not even across different departments. So here I'm going to show the real terms change in departmental budgets from this year to 2019-20, so over the next two years. 
Notice the transport department is faring fairly well. That's because of that large increase in investment spending that I spoke about. But more generally, while some departments are relatively protected from the cuts, others are really seeing quite large reductions in their real terms budget. So look, for example, at the Ministry of Justice or DEFRA, having to find almost 20% real terms cuts over the next few years. And if we compare this to the total cut implied by these plans from the, you know, over the decades from 2010, you see that the same departments that are having to find further cuts have already had to find large cuts already. So further spending cuts to come and a, a relatively large tax rise, what does that mean for tax and spending in a, a historical context? So total managed expenditure, that's the total amount that the public sector spends. And as a share of national income, that's due to reach its lowest level since 2003, since the mid-2000s. What about public sector receipts? Well, that's actually due to reach its highest level since the mid-1980s. Public sector receipts are a combination of tax revenues and some other revenues. For example, interest and dividends or the operating surplus of publicly owned corporations. If we just isolate the tax element of that, we're actually set to reach the highest tax level since 1969-70 and to maintain tax revenues at a level that hasn't been seen since the 1950s. So a relatively low level of spending in historical context, a very high level of taxes, and that means a pretty low level of borrowing. By 2021, we were meant to have more or less uh, the lowest deficit that we've had since we last ran a surplus at the turn of the millennium. Now, all of this is due to be, um, in 2017, to be structural borrowing. That is, it's not just going to disappear due to greater than expected economic growth. And this is important because it um, one of the government's fiscal targets refers to this, and structural borrowing must be below 2% of national income in 2020-21. Now, on these plans, the government had a fair amount of headroom with this target. They could afford uh, spending to increase or taxes to fall by a combination of £26 billion in that year, and they'd still be on course to meet this target. However, there was also a broader fiscal objective that the government was aiming for to eliminate the deficit entirely by the mid-2020s. And that didn't look easy even on these plans. There was still due to be a deficit of about 0.7% of national income in 2021, and demographic pressures were actually going to be putting upward pressure on spending over the five years subsequent to that. So that's where we were set to stand with borrowing. Roughly, the, the stock of all borrowing that the government has done, done to date is public sector net debts. You can see that the debt increased sharply due to the very large deficits that we've run since the financial crisis. Notice the profile of debt over the next few years. It's set to first increase reasonably sharply and then fall quite sharply. That's due to a slightly artificial effect due to a Bank of England scheme whereby they're offering loans to private sector banks, which will then be paid back in a couple of years. So if we take the Bank of England out of these numbers, the profile is much flatter. And that matters because that affects one of the government's fiscal targets, which requires debt to be falling as a share of national income between two years, 2019-20 and 2020-21. And this Bank of England scheme actually makes that a pretty easy target to meet. OK, so that was the March plan. Further spending cuts and tax rises due over the next few years, but still that target of eliminating the deficit entirely looking ambitious. How have developments since March changed this? Is that making that target easier or harder to meet? Well, firstly, some good news. And actually, the public finance data this year paints a rather rosier picture than we saw in the March budget. Borrowing last year is now thought to have been about £6 billion lower than the OBR estimated back in March. And this seems to be carrying over to this year as well. Borrowing is running behind where you would expect so far this year, based on the March forecast. Now, not all of that improvement is likely to persist over the year. In particular, self-assessment receipts are likely to be much weaker this year than they were last year. That's due to a dividend tax change that encouraged uh, lots of dividend payouts that were scored in the last tax year. And that, we won't see that in the numbers until self-assessment receipts roll in in January and February. However, across a whole series of taxes, we're seeing better than expected performance. So what I'm going to show on this chart is, across all of these different taxes, the growth rate year on year implied by the March forecast. And then what hap what's happened on the year to date. So the first six months of this year compared with the first six months of last year. You can see across all of these taxes, we're seeing an improvement that's greater than that implies by the March forecast. 
And if these were all to persist for the whole year, it would lead to a pretty substantial increase in revenues and therefore uh, contribute to lower borrowing. We think that quite a lot of this could well persist, and that could mean an improvement of about £6 billion. The spending data also implies slightly lower borrowing this year. Spending on tax credits has been lower than forecast, and contributions to the EU will also be lower for this year because the EU has underspent its budget by more than the OBR assumes. Now, the public finances are looking stronger than they did in March, and that comes despite the fact that growth so far in 2017 has been a little bit weaker than the OBR expected back in March. So weaker growth alone, we would have expected to lead to higher, not lower borrowing. And so taking that into account as well, the underlying improvement in the public finances is even stronger. If this strength persists into the medium term, so it's not just a temporary 2017-18 effect, but reflects something real about the strength of the public finances, then this could lead to lower borrowing, worth about £12 billion by 2021-22. So what else has changed since March? Well, there have been quite a few policy announcements by the government. What effect will they have on the public finances this time around? Well, the first measure that the government announced after the budget came just one week later. That was a reversal of the policy on self-employed national insurance contributions. Now, that measure only costs about £500 million per year, although it could have a bigger effect in the, short, in the long run if we see a continuation of the trends in the labour market towards self-employment. The next policy change that came along was in the aftermath of the general election. That was the confidence and supply deal that committed to spending £450 million per year for two years on health, education and infrastructure in Northern Ireland. Again, in the context of the total UK public finances, that's not a huge deal, it's quite a small number, but it's quite a substantial increase in spending um, for Northern Ireland. Perhaps the largest measure announced since March came around party conference season. This was changes to the student loan system. So firstly, fees are going to be frozen at £9,250 for one year. That's a pretty small change in the short run. Effectively, it just means a small uh, short-term cut to university funding. Of course, if that was to be continued indefinitely, that would become a very big deal. It would effectively represent an erosion of taxpayer support for universities. The bigger policy change is an increase in the repayment threshold. That is, how much you have to earn each year before you start repaying your student loan. That's going up from £21,000 to £25,000. Now, student loan debt is written off 30 years after you graduate. And because the repayment threshold has gone up, that means more of the uh, student loan debt that's out there will never be paid off. That effectively means that the government is contributing more to, um, to university funding. And that comes at quite a large long-run cost, of about £2 billion per year. However, the way it counts in the public finances is that we only add that to borrowing when those loans are actually written off. That's 30 years after the 2012 cohort of students um, I have 30 years after the 2012 cohort of students graduate, so that's not until the mid-2040s, so perhaps the Chancellor's not worrying too far ahead just yet. And so if we look at the total effects of policy measures announced since the budget, that could increase borrowing by a relatively modest amount, about £1.5 billion per year. So not completely changing the public finances, but still affecting the bottom line. Now, later this week, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England are going to meet and decide um, where to set the base rate. And the expectation now is that they may well choose to increase interest rates this time around. Now, well, that wasn't the expectation back in March. So this chart shows the market expectation for uh, the base rate at the time of the March budget. And this is what the OBR directly plug into their forecast. So it directly affects the forecast. And this is the expectation now in October. You can see that a rate rise is expected much sooner, although the difference is a bit smaller towards the end of the forecast periods. Ordinarily, changes in the base rate wouldn't directly affect the public finances. But the quantitative easing scheme is actually temporarily flattering the public finances because the Bank of England owns about £400 billion worth of gilts. So when the government um, spends... Uh, sends interest rate payments on those gilts, it's actually just sending it to another part of the public sector. So that doesn't add to public sector borrowing. However, there is an interest rate scored on those gilts, and that is the base rate. So if you double the base rate from 0.25 to 0.5, you double the amount of debt interest spending um, associated with those gilts. 
How much could that affect the public finances? Well, that could add about £1.5 billion to borrowing in 2018-19. But because the gap is getting smaller relative to the March forecast, it would only add about £0.7 billion by the end. Now, ordinarily, the most important thing for the public finances is the performance of the economy. If the economy performs well, we get more tax receipts, borrowing goes down. So how have forecasts for uh, the economy changed since March? Well, this, this line shows the OBR uh, forecast for the path of the economy back in March, and it's completely aligned with the Bank of England forecast made just one month earlier. How has the Bank of England forecast changed since then? Well, here's the latest one back in August, and it's only a very modest downgrade, expecting the economy to be about 0.3% smaller in 2019 than they thought in February. This really is a very modest downgrade in the context of the overall macroeconomic uncertainty out there, and broadly means that um, the February forecast holds, but it would still have some effect on the public finances if the economy were to be a little bit smaller than expected. Okay, so let's take all of those changes that I've discussed together. The improvement um, from the public finance data so far this year, the slight increase from, in borrowing from policy measures announced so far, and a higher market expectation over interest rates. And let's assume that the OBR downgrades in line with the Bank of England and other independent forecasters. What would that mean for borrowing? Well, here's the OBR March forecast, and here's what we're terming our moderate scenario, where all of those things that I discussed materialize. And actually, borrowing could be a little bit lower, about £5 billion by the end of the forecast, if these things were to happen. That would be a slight improvement. I'm sure the Chancellor will welcome it. But it would be a pretty small change in the context of the overall public finances. Again, with the amount of uncertainty going on, it would basically say that the assessment at the time of the March budget still broadly held today. Unfortunately, that looks like a rather optimistic scenario. That's because the OBR have indicated that a productivity downgrade is likely. Robert Choate, the chairman of the OBR, said in his launch of their recent forecast evaluation report that for now we are minded to revise down potential productivity growth significantly. Now productivity growth is really the thing that drives economic growth in the long run. So productivity growth being lower is bad news for all of us. And it's perhaps not understanding to understand, it's not difficult to understand why productivity is likely um, to be downgraded this time if we look at the OBR's forecasting records since 2010. So this is the outturn data for output per hour. That's our measure of productivity since 2005. And you can see that it's basically flat lines since 2010. If we have a look at what the OBR has successively assumed in different forecasts, you can see they consistently expected growth to return to about 2% per year, and it hasn't materialized yet, and that was still true in their latest March forecast. Note also that some of the outturn data has been revised since the March forecast, making their um, latest forecasts look particularly optimistic. So based on this picture, you may, think, you may wonder why the OBR kept expecting a return to a 2% trend. But it's much more understandable if you take a longer-term view. So between 1972 and 2007, productivity growth averaged about 2% per year. And even though it dipped below it occasionally, it would always return to that trend, if not even better, relatively soon afterwards. So what's happened since then? Well, we had large falls in productivity during the Great Recession. But since then, productivity growth has been really terrible, historically terrible, averaging only about 0.4% per year. And if we look at the March forecast from the OBR, you can see um, that, that that downgrade to 2016 so the subsequent 2016 forecast makes it look particularly optimistic. But more generally, they've said that they now think that this is too optimistic a path for the economy. So how might they down product downgrade productivity? And what that might that mean for the public finances? Well, we consider two scenarios. Firstly, a very poor scenario. And that's where the OBR decides that the terrible productivity growth of the last seven years is the new normal. We can't expect productivity growth better than 0.4% per year going forwards. Now, that does seem extremely pessimistic. So we also consider an alternative scenario that we term weak productivity growth. And that's where the OBR downgrades halfway towards that terrible average of the last seven years from the March forecast, effectively splitting these lines. Now, in these scenarios, we also slightly adjust uh, growth to account for the fact that the hours and employment forecasts are likely to contribute more to growth than expected back in March, but it is the downgrade to productivity that dominates 
So just to go through those scenarios again, in the very poor scenario, average productivity growth of just 0.4% per year, average real GDP growth of just 0.7% per year, compared with 1.8% in March. And in that weak scenario, average real growth of just 1.3% per year. So what would that mean for borrowing? Well, here are our OBR and moderate scenarios. If we now see a very poor scenario and a weak scenario, borrowing would be higher in both of these cases. The downgrade to productivity would outweigh any good news that we've had on the public finances so far this year. In the weak scenario, borrowing could be about £20 billion higher if the Chancellor didn't take any offsetting measures, and over £50 billion higher if the terrible growth of the last seven years is the new normal. Now, because this is weaker productivity, it doesn't reflect a temporary weakness in the economy, so any effect on borrowing is also an effect on structural borrowing. So we look at structural borrowing as a percentage of national income, and we look at the government's 2% target. In the very poor scenario, this target would be missed entirely. In the weak scenario, we project that the government would still be on course to meet it, but with only £13 billion headroom. They could only afford borrowing to increase by £13 billion for them still to be on track. And that's just half the headroom that the Chancellor would have had just eight months before. Based on previous forecasting errors in the public finances, there would be an around 40% chance that this target would be missed um, if this were the new forecast. So finally, more borrowing also means more national debt as a share of national income. In both scenarios, it would be higher. Just to focus for a moment on that very poor scenario, um, debt will be more than 10% of national income higher. Um, it will be stabilizing at about 90% of national income. And yet it would still be due to fall between 2019-20 and 2020-21. The government would still be on course to meet that fiscal target, which I think shows just how ineffective that target is. So there has been some good news on the public finances this year. The data this year looks like borrowing might turn out lower. But it's a substantial productivity downgrade that's likely to dominate in the medium run. Now, how might a chancellor respond to this, and what are, what are Mr. Hammond's options? Well, I'm now going to hand over to Carl, who's going to talk through some options for the chancellor. <laughs> 